This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Michael Scherer. Typee by Herman Melville. Chapter 22 From the time that my lameness had decreased, I had made a daily practice of visiting Mahavi at the tea, who invariably gave me a most cordial reception. I was always accompanied in these excursions by Fayaway and the ever-present Cory Cory. The former, as soon as we reached the vicinity of the tea, which was rigorously tabooed to the whole female sex, withdrew to a neighboring hut, as if her feminine delicacy restrained her from approaching a habitation which might be regarded as a sort of bachelor's hall. And in good truth it might well have been so considered. Although it was the permanent residence of several distinguished chiefs, and of the noble Mahavi in particular, it was still at certain seasons the favorite haunt of all the jolly, talkative, and elderly savages of the Vale, who resorted thither in the same way that similar characters frequent a tavern in civilized countries. There they would remain hour after hour, chatting, smoking, eating poey poey, or busily engaged in sleeping for the good of their constitutions. This building appeared to be the headquarters of the valley, where all flying rumors concentrated, and to have seen it filled with a crowd of the natives, all males, conversing in animated clusters, while multitudes were continually coming and going, one would have thought it a kind of savage exchange, where the rise and fall of Polynesian stock was discussed. Mahavi acted as supreme lord over the place, spending the greater portion of his time there, and often when, at particular hours of the day, it was deserted by nearly everyone else except the verd antique-looking centenarians, who were fixtures in the building, the chief himself was sure to be found enjoying his otium cum dignitate upon the luxurious mats which covered the floor. Whenever I made my appearance, he invariably rose, and, like a gentleman doing the honors of his mansion, invited me to repose myself wherever I pleased, and, calling out, Tamari, boy, a little fellow would appear, and then, retiring for an instant, return with some savory mess, from which the chief would press me to regale myself. To tell the truth, Mahavi was indebted to the excellence of his viands for the honor of my repeated visits, a matter which cannot appear singular, when it is borne in mind that bachelors all the world over are famous for serving up unexceptionable repasts. One day, on drawing near to the tea, I observed that extensive preparations were going forward, plainly betokening some approaching festival. Some of the symptoms reminded me of the stir produced among the scullions of a large hotel, where a grand jubilee dinner is about to be given. The natives were hurrying about hither and thither, engaged in various duties, some lugging off to the stream enormous hollow bamboos for the purpose of filling them with water, others chasing furious-looking hogs through the bushes in their endeavors to capture them, and numbers employed in kneading great mountains of poey poey heaped up in huge wooden vessels. After observing these lively indications for a while, I was attracted to a neighboring grove by a prodigious squeaking which I heard there. On reaching the spot, I found it proceeded from a large hog, which a number of the natives were forcibly holding to the earth, while a muscular fellow, armed with a bludgeon, was ineffectually aiming murderous blows at the skull of the unfortunate porker. Again and again he missed his writhing and struggling victim, but though puffing and panting with his exertions, he still continued them, and after striking a sufficient number of blows to have demolished an entire drove of oxen, with one crashing stroke he laid him dead at his feet. Without letting any blood from the body, it was immediately carried to a fire which had been kindled near at hand, and four savages, taking hold of the carcass by its legs, passed it rapidly to and fro in the flames. In a moment, the smell of burning bristles betrayed the object of this procedure. Having got thus far in the matter, the body was removed to a little distance, and being disemboweled, the entrails were laid aside as choice parts, and the whole carcass thoroughly washed with water. An ample, thick green cloth, composed of the long, thick leaves of a species of palm tree, ingeniously tacked together with little pins of bamboo, was now spread upon the ground 
in which the body being carefully rolled, it was borne to an oven previously prepared to receive it. Here it was at once laid upon the heated stones at the bottom, and covered with thick layers of leaves, the whole being quickly hidden from sight by a mound of earth raised over it. Such is the summary style in which the Taipees convert perverse-minded and rebellious hogs into the most docile and amiable pork, a morsel of which, placed on the tongue, melts like a soft smile from the lips of beauty. I commend their peculiar mode of proceeding to the consideration of all butchers, cooks, and housewives. The hapless porker whose fate I have just rehearsed was not the only one who suffered on that memorable day. Many a dismal grunt, many an imploring squeak, proclaimed what was going on throughout the whole extent of the valley, and I verily believe the first-born of every litter perished before the setting of that fatal sun. The scene around the tea was now most animated. Hogs and poey poey were baking in numerous ovens, which, heaped up with fresh earth into slight elevations, looked like so many anthills. Scores of the savages were vigorously plying their stone pestles in preparing masses of poey poey, and numbers were gathering green breadfruit and young coconuts in the surrounding groves, while an exceeding great multitude, with a view of encouraging the rest in their labors, stood still and kept shouting most lustily without intermission. It is a peculiarity among these people that when engaged in any employment, they always make a prodigious fuss about it. So seldom do they ever exert themselves that when they do work, they seem determined that so meritorious an action shall not escape the observation of those around. If, for example, they have occasion to remove a stone to a little distance, which perhaps might be carried by two able-bodied men, a whole swarm gather about it, and, after a vast deal of palavering, lift it up among them, every one struggling to get hold of it, and bear it off yelling and panting as if accomplishing some mighty achievement. Seeing them on these occasions, one is reminded of an infinity of black ants clustering about and dragging away to some hole the leg of a deceased fly. Having for some time attentively observed these demonstrations of good cheer, I entered the tea, where Mahavi sat complacently looking out upon the busy scene, and occasionally issuing his orders. The chief appeared to be in an extraordinary flow of spirits, and gave me to understand that on the morrow there would be grand doings in the groves generally, and at the tea in particular, and urged me by no means to absent myself. In commemoration of what event, however, or in honor of what distinguished personage the feast was to be given, altogether passed my comprehension. Mahavi sought to enlighten my ignorance but he failed as signally as when he had endeavored to initiate me into the perplexing arcana of the taboo. On leaving the tea, Cory Cory, who had as a matter of course accompanied me, observing that my curiosity remained unabated, resolved to make everything plain and satisfactory. With this intent he escorted me through the taboo groves, pointing out to my notice a variety of objects, and endeavored to explain them in such an indescribable jargon of words that it almost put me in bodily pain to listen to him. In particular, he led me to a remarkable pyramidical structure some three yards square at the base, and perhaps ten feet in height, which had lately been thrown up, and occupied a very conspicuous position. It was composed principally of large empty calabashes, with a few polished coconut shells, and looked not unlike a cenotaph of skulls, my Cicerone perceived the astonishment with which I gazed at this monument of savage crockery, and immediately addressed himself to the task of enlightening me. But all in vain, and to this hour the nature of the monument remains a complete mystery to me. As, however, it formed so prominent a feature in the approaching revels, I bestowed upon the latter, in my own mind, the title of the Feast of Calabashes. The following morning, awaking rather late, I perceived the whole of Marheyo's family busily engaged in preparing for the festival. The old warrior himself was arranging in round balls the two gray locks of hair that were suffered to grow from the crown of his head. His earrings and spear, both well polished, lay beside him, while the highly decorative pair of shoes hung suspended from a projecting cane against the side of the house. 
the young men were similarly employed, and the fair damsels, including Fayaway, were anointing themselves with Akka, arranging their long tresses, and performing other matters connected with the duties of the toilette. Having completed their preparations, the girls now exhibited themselves in gala costume, the most conspicuous feature of which was a necklace of beautiful white flowers with the stems removed, and strung closely together upon a single fiber of tapa. Corresponding ornaments were inserted in their ears and woven garlands upon their heads. About their waist they wore a short tunic of spotless white tapa, and some of them superadded to this a mantle of the same material, tied in an elaborate bow upon the left shoulder, and falling about the figure in picturesque folds. Thus arrayed, I would have matched the charming Fayaway against any beauty in the world. People may say what they will about the taste evinced by our fashionable ladies in dress. Their jewels, their feathers, their silks, and their furbelows would have sunk into utter insignificance beside the exquisite simplicity of attire adopted by the nymphs of the Vale on this festive occasion. I should like to have seen a gallery of coronation beauties at Westminster Abbey, confronted for a moment by this band of island girls, their stiffness, formality, and affectation contrasted with the artless vivacity and unconcealed natural graces of these savage maidens. It would be the Venus de Medici, placed beside a milliner's doll. It was not long before Cory Cory and myself were left alone in the house, the rest of its inmates having departed for the taboo groves. My valet was all impatience to follow them, and was as fidgety about my dilatory movements as a diner out waiting hat in hand at the bottom of the stairs for some lagging companion. At last, yielding to his importunities, I set out for the tea. As we passed the houses peeping out from the groves through which our route lay, I noticed that they were entirely deserted by their inhabitants. When we reached the rock that abruptly terminated the path and concealed from us the festive scene, wild shouts and a confused blending of voices assured me that the occasion, whatever it might be, had drawn together a great multitude. Cory Cory, previous to mounting the elevation, paused for a moment, like a dandy at a ballroom door, to put a hasty finish to his toilette. During this short interval, the thought struck me that I ought myself, perhaps, to be taking some little pains with my appearance. But as I had no holiday raiment, I was not a little puzzled to devise some means of decorating myself. However, as I felt desirous to create a sensation, I determined to do all that lay in my power, and knowing that I could not delight the savages more than by conforming to their style of dress, I removed from my person the large robe of tapa which I was accustomed to wear over my shoulders whenever I sallied into the open air, and remained merely girt about with a short tunic descending from my waist to my knees. My quick-witted attendant fully appreciated the compliment I was paying to the costume of his race, and began more sedulously to arrange the folds of the one only garment which remained to me. Whilst he was doing this, I caught sight of a knot of young lasses, who were sitting near us on the grass, surrounded by heaps of flowers which they were forming into garlands. I motioned to them to bring some of their handiwork to me, and in an instant a dozen wreaths were at my disposal. One of them I put round the apology for a hat which I had been forced to construct for myself out of palmetto leaves, and some of the others I converted into a splendid girdle. These operations finished, with the slow and dignified step of a full-dressed bow, I ascended the rock, 